What's up everybody? Welcome back. Long time no see. Snack Pack back with you and today I'm going to show you how to hover a helicopter like a boss. We are back in Microsoft Flight Simulator and I'm in the Bell 407 and I am in Chicago, Illinois. And I'm up on top of a skyscraper and how did I get here? How did I get here? <laughs> so if you want to be able to land a helicopter anywhere and in particular on a precision point like on the top of a skyscraper you're going to have to be able to hold a hover first. All right, you're going to have to be able to hold a steady hover. So today we're going to talk about all things hovering. So what we're going to do first, take off here, and we'll do a little cyclic dive. We'll get down to ground level. All right, so it's snowing in Chicago right now. I've got uh, live weather on, live players, so guessing Chicago is taking on some snow right now so just so we can get a little bit of contrast I'm gonna do some hover work here on this uh, looks like some kind of interstate all right so looking outside we're gonna turn on our fluid dynamics and you're gonna see the air is kind of getting kicked all over the place but as soon as I start pulling in power pulling in collective you start to see this downflow of air through the rotor system. That's our induced flow. So when I pick it up to a hover, I'm in an IGE hover right now. Let me turn that off. That's a little disorienting. So I'm in what we call an IGE hover in ground effect. The air that's coming through the rotor disc and subsequently coming from top to bottom, shooting out the bottom of my rotor disc, is what we would call induced flow, right? The downward motion of air through the rotor disc. Now to hold an IGE hover, I'm just a few feet off the ground. And really what I'm doing is I'm looking at about a 45 degree angle, about 50 meters or so off of my nose here. And what that's doing is that's giving me guidance for my lateral drift, right? So I could look forward and I could judge my lateral drift. You see how I'm drifting right and left, right? Uh-oh, thing's a little touchy. So I can judge my lateral drift by looking forward, but I don't know if I'm drifting forward or backwards, right? So if I look out to the side, looks like I'm drifting forward slightly, right? So we can continue to scan, and when you fly with like night vision goggles, it really restricts your view. You don't really have peripheral vision, so you really have to you really have to scan all around. But it might look like I've landed right now, but I'm actually still in the air, right? I'm just floating. In fact, all right. So holding a hover IGE in ground effect is much easier because we are closer to the ground, and we get something called motion parallax. Motion parallax is when things that are further away seem to be moving slower relative to our motion than things that are closer to us, right? So right now I'm just looking at this little hash mark on the ground, this little hash mark on the road, and I'm using that as a reference. So I don't want to be drifting fore aft or laterally. And I'm pretty much just maintaining my collective position so that I maintain my altitude here, right? But just know that if I put like right pedal in, it's going to want to climb because I'm reducing the torque on the rotor system, you know? So I have to be very steady with all my flight controls. Okay, cool. Let's land. Just gently set her down. All right. Now, as we look outside, we turn our fluid dynamics back on and we can see this air moving down through the rotor disc, all right? Down through the rotor system. Get a little better angle here. So as I pull in collective, we increase that induced flow. Oops, and we're starting to come off the ground now. Now here's the thing. In ground effect, the air that's coming through this rotor disc is getting interrupted by the ground. So the velocity of the induced flow is less when I have ground effect, right? And ground effect is gonna be approximately one diameter of this whole rotor disc. So as I'm in ground effect, I need a particular angle of incidence. That's the blade pitch of each of the rotor blades, right? I need a particular angle of incidence to maintain my angle of attack. The angle of attack is what really matters here, all right? Because there's a particular angle of attack and you'd have to talk to an aerospace engineer to 
figure out exactly what the angle is, right? But there's a particular angle of attack that's going to allow me to hover, all right? And so there's a particular angle of incidence I need to pull in to maintain that angle of attack. Well, that angle of attack doesn't change whether I'm in a low IGE hover or whether I come out of ground effect and come up above the height of one rotor disc diameter. But what does have to change is the angle of incidence, so I am going to need to pull up more on this uppy downy stick here. All right, so let's turn this off. So as I pull in, I'm going to need a little more torque. Let's see what I need for an IGE hover. In ground effect, hovering at 46, 45, 47%, right about 47. So now I start to come up, I'm straight up, I'm looking out right, looking straight, looking out the right, looking straight, looking out the right, looking straight. I should be out of ground effect right now. Let's cancel out my climb. I've got zero vertical speed. And that's taking me about 50% torque, right? So it's a little more. I need a little more torque. I'm increasing the pitch of the blades, which means I need more power from the engines to compensate for the drag that the rotor blades are creating. And so now hovering OGE, it's a little bit harder to do that 45 degree off the nose thing because of what we were talking about earlier, motion parallax, right? The ground is much further away from me. So now I really need to look forward so I'm kind of picking the corner of this building right in front of me, this smaller one. And then I look out to the right, and I can see I'm drifting forward a little bit. So now I'm really having to kind of scan back and forth, maintain my hover. And then as we continue to add power, I'll just come straight up. Now just a quick word about Brotalian.com. Brotalian.com is a clothing and apparel brand. they got all kinds of awesome stuff. You need to go check them out. Veteran owned and operated, uh, operated by Army Aviators. So please go check out Brotalian, all kinds of cool stuff, including this Irene flag that you can get. This is one of my favorite things on the website. And now you can get 15% off your entire order using coupon code SNACKPACK. So go check them out. Link in the description. You're going to see the ground's going to get even further away, and it's going to be even harder to maintain our specific position over the ground, right? Does that say check instruments? Maybe I'm pulling in too much power. Alright, continue climbing, continue to climb. Need more power. Now, I need more power to transition from one OGE altitude to the next, but to maintain it, let's zero out my vertical speed here. Zero it out. And it looks like we're pulling in right about 50% torque again, right? So. As I was at a lower OGE hover, I was only about 50 feet off the ground. Now I'm more like 200 feet off the ground. I needed the same amount of power to hover in both of those instances. And that's because the helicopter doesn't really know how high it is off the ground. It just knows it's out of ground effect. Once I'm out of ground effect, the velocity of the induced flow, the air coming through the rotor system, is much, much faster because it's not doesn't have the ground there to interrupt it. Because of that, I need more power, I need a higher angle of incidence to maintain the same angle of attack that I needed to hover in IGE. So the angle of attack doesn't change, but the angle of incidence has to change in order to overcome the increase of induced flow velocity. Additionally, you have rotor tip vortices so the air is escaping over the airfoil out the back, but some of it escapes off the tip of the rotor disc there, off the tip path plane is what we call that up there. Some of it escapes off the tip path plane, and when modified with induced flow, the downward motion, it creates these vor vortexes on the tip of the rotor disc. And as we increase our angle of incidence and start climbing those rotor tip vortices, get bigger because of the velocity of induced flow gets bigger. And the bigger those rotor tip vortices are, that's taking away lifting power from our rotor disc, right? It's decreasing the portion of the rotor blade that can actually produce lift. So that's another reason why we need an increase in power. Alright, so I'm going to pull in a bunch of power here and we're going to land on top of this building here. Guys, this is much, much easier in VR. Alright, uh, trying to fly with 
uh, helicopter and Microsoft Flight Simulator, even with head tracking, is much more challenging than flying in VR. Especially doing these hovers. So if you're struggling with this at home, don't worry. Know that it's actually easier to do this in a real helicopter, right? But in VR, I mean, we're pretty pretty close to the real thing here. It's really not that much different. All right, so this is very white up here. It's like a low contrast environment. I'm gonna try to, I'll turn my tail right, nose left. And we'll try to kind of slide in here. So again, I have to be able to maintain a hover to be able to land at a precision point like this on top of a building. And I'm just taking things nice and slow, sliding right. All right, get my stable hover and then we'll come straight down. flying it all the way to the ground. There we go. Always fly it all the way to the ground. One of the main uh, issues I see with novice helicopter pilots is they try to rush the very end, right? So they'll have a stable hover right here. They're doing great. And then it's like, oh, I just want to get on the ground. And they'll slam the collective all the way to the ground, right? But don't do that, right? Get comfortable with the uncomfortable. This spot right here where we're right above the ground is very dangerous because of something called dynamic rollover, right? So if I create a pivot point, like let's say my skid gets on the ground like this and I'm rolling, this could easily turn into a situation where I roll the whole helicopter over, right? So we have to be very careful, but people get scared of that and they just kind of slam the collective down, <laughs> but that makes it even worse, right? That increases your potential to roll the helicopter over. So what you really want to do is just get your 45 degree angle and come down nice and slow. Don't hunt for the ground. Just continue coming down until the helicopter's on the ground. There we go. Nice and soft. Thanks so much for sticking around, guys, and watching snack pack videos. I'm going to try to get as many out as I can in the near future. I am uh, starting to work on my fixed wing ratings and getting the ball rolling on transitioning from active duty army into the airlines. So I've got a lot going on right now on top of holding down the fort at work. But um, as I get time, I'm going to continue making these videos for you guys. Let me know in the comments if there's anything uh, particular you'd like to see happen in a snack pack video. Uh, maybe some things you're curious about, whether it be helicopters or airplanes, VFR flight, IFR flight, whatever it is. Let me know in the comments what you'd really like to see, and uh, I'll try to make it happen in the near future. Till then, we'll be planning a fixed wing IFR flight in Microsoft Flight Simulator. I'll be doing a live stream, and I'll release details on that very soon, but it'll probably be on a Sunday. So, all right, thanks so much for sticking around. Make sure you like and subscribe, guys. Have a good one. Stack Pack out.